Hello and welcome to another Wiltshire Creative Big Interview. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today by a man who's described as the genre-defying, award-winning, record-breaking beatboxer, producer and live looper. That's quite a title, SK Shlomo. <laughs> um, welcome. Welcome. Hi. It's lovely to talk to you today. That's, that's quite a title. Yeah, when you say it like that, it sounds pretty grand. <laughs> 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 and we're meeting in very grand circumstances today, of course, as well. Um, <laughs> and we first met through the Salisbury International Arts Festival on the occasions that you've brought one of your shows to Salisbury. And mm. we've continued talking um, about the festival and a shared interest in self-expression, creativity. And I'm sure we'll get back onto that um, in a little while. But for, mm. for those who have joined us um, can you tell us about um, how you would describe beatboxing? So beatboxing is when you make music with your voice and your mouth, like uh, and it's an art form that started in the 80s uh, with hip hop and then it evolved into all kinds, like, like all art forms, it evolved all kind of sub art forms underneath it. Um, and yeah but for me it just started when i was a kid and my parents bought me a drum kit for my uh, eighth birthday and then three days later they said i wasn't allowed to practice so i had to find a way to practice rhythms that didn't kind of shake the whole house and that's how it evolved and that just came about playing in your bedroom yeah basically just uh having fun um just exploring like it wasn't really something that i did for other people it was like it was for me and then um yeah, I didn't really find out other people did it until I was a teenager and I realised wow. that it would A, impress my friends and B, uh, get us all free chips at the chip shop. <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, working on any skill that gets free chips is, is a really worth yeah. thing to do. And, and what, what, does, what does that lead on, lead on to musically? Well, I think for me, like, uh, before, I, before that moment came and I realised that, that other people would like beatboxing and that beatboxing existed outside of just my my own experiments uh i'd spent my whole childhood and teens uh being a real i uh, had real big designs of being a drummer like i loved drumming and uh i just practiced and practiced and practiced and um you know despite my parents restricting it like it they couldn't stop me really and so i'd really had a broad interest in music and i was very into jazz and i was very into like um music from around the world like Latin music and salsa and samba and all like whatever I could get my hands on uh, and it meant that by the time I actually then started to identify as a beatboxer like I think I had a really broad kind of sense of what I wanted to do which might I don't know if this is true but it felt at the time like most other people who were beatboxing were sticking with a certain style because that's where it evolved from like hip-hop um, but for me it was like I didn't really have that restriction I just saw it as music so I could kind of do whatever I wanted with it and I think that freed me up to do a lot of the collaborations I went on to do like working with Bjork was a real big one like uh when I worked with Bjork she just wanted to she was the first person who really saw the beatboxing as just a, a means of expression as opposed to a trick or a way to impress people or a way like a gimmick like for her she was just saw me as another in instrument or another musician and that really kind of opened my mind up to it and, and was there a moment, how did you learn about the music industry and how to interact with? Because you've gone from learning, uh, developing techniques in your bedroom mm. to sharing it with friends, to working with mm. people. Uh, what, how did you learn about the industry and a way into that? I guess it's baby steps. Like I left home uh, when I was 18 to go, I moved up to Leeds. I grew up in the South and I went up to the North. Uh, to go and study but um, I didn't really do any studying in the end I just started doing music and one of the first things I did when I got to Leeds was I looked in the in the yellow pages because I didn't have an internet connection and I just found all the music studios in Leeds and I phoned all of them up and said I, I, I want to make a demo I'm a beatboxer uh, and some of them didn't reply some of them said yeah that'll cost you 100 quid or whatever and one guy uh, called me straight back and he was like you're a what? We need to find out. You need to come and have a cup of tea, mate, don't you? We need to find out what that means. And uh, that turned out that guy was a guy called Bruce Wood. He had a studio called Touchwood, and that studio was where Nightmares on Wax had done a lot of work. Where a lot of kind of Leeds icons uh, had done a lot of work there. 
and he kind of took me under his wing and started introducing me to lots of people in that part of the music industry and that started that led to me getting my first gigs and my first kind of paid work uh and then yeah i guess the bjork thing was a big deal because at that point i was still working in a day job and um and I'd just put those demos that I'd made with Bruce on online on a little website that we'd made. And uh, and that's how she'd found it. And then out of that, I suddenly had this kind of worldwide profile when her album came out. And she did a whole album of just voice. Um, and there were lots of different characters on the album who were all doing weird and interesting things with their voice. And, and I suddenly started having all these inquiries, international inquiries saying, we've heard you on this album. Can you come and do a gig out in like Portugal or Australia or like... South American, I was like, well, you know, I'm just like, at this point, I'm like 20 years old and then, you know, working in a call center in Leeds. And it's like, yeah, the world starts massively expanding really quickly. It's exciting. And, and was there a moment where, where a career in music became a reality or was it a slow growth? You know, there, there's, there's a point where, you know, you're working in a call center and then you're flying around the world. Yeah. Was there just a moment when you went, oh, okay, this is, I, I can, I can do this for a living. I can give up that other stuff. Or... Yeah, there was a very, there was an exact moment, and it came that same summer because uh, that was the summer of 2004 when when I worked with Bjork, and that same summer, right? So I've been working various temp jobs, and uh, that same summer I got a job, I got a job offer from Leeds City Council to teach workshops uh, for six weeks. Uh, over the summer holidays in the different parks around Leeds and I was like this is amazing I've finally got a job in music so I quit my job and I showed up on the first day and uh, it turned out that they meant when they said six weeks they meant one workshop every week for six weeks so it's actually six days of work and I was like oh no I've just quit my job but I decided that if I could make I think I was making something like 200 pounds or just like 180 pounds or something a week in my temp job and I decided if I can make 180 pounds out of music this week then I'll I won't bother going back to that. And I just kept that going every week. And luckily, you know, what are we now like? 16 years later, I've managed to, I've, I've managed to keep that as a benchmark. If one week I can't make a couple hundred quid, then I'll go and get a real job. <laughs> Although saying that in the lockdown, I've, uh, I've, finally, I've finally failed that. <laughs> we are living in an extraordinary time. And I think it's okay to, to throw our own rules and benchmarks out the window at this point, isn't it? Yeah, yeah for sure. And... Just thinking about those extraordinary experiences within your music career to date, mm. rather than talking about it like it's happened, we're, we're living in it, which is so exciting. Mm. Is there a particular high point or, or moment that really sticks in your mind? Yeah, there's, there's a few real key moments. Um, a lot of them involve Glastonbury, because that's like, uh, for me, that's kind of a bit of a spiritual, musical kind of mecca for me and lots of people like it's it's a strange there's a strange aura about that place i've had a lot of like really formative moments there so uh, as as a music lover as well as a performer um see so glastonbury is a real special place to ever to do a show and like i've done shows there on the tiniest little stages at like two in the morning with like 200 people and you just can't move and i've done you know shows there on the main stages to like a sea of people and like they're both incredible experiences um so yeah glasto and then I, honestly this last few weeks has felt like another one of these really huge moments like i've kind of been using this analogy uh with the, with with doing anything creative but especially with music music industry is it's a bit like surfing like these waves come and uh sometimes the wave comes and you're not ready and it'll just crash over you and that can sweep you away and it can really mess with you uh, but you can just let it wash over you and you can get back up again and be ready to surf the next wave. But if you are ready and it's just all the things have lined up in the right place in the right time, you happen to be ready, you've got your material ready, the team around you are all ready, you can surf that wave and then, then it's really exciting and you, it's really thrilling uh, and, it, it, and amazing things happen. And as long as you're okay to then be ready to come back off your surfboard when that wave's done and you're ready to get on the next one, that's great. If you try and stay there past the wave, then then that's when trouble happens. So this is... This is a, a helpful analogy for me in terms of like the well-being side of it because it can be re very intense for for artists and it can be like a lot of them don't get very much support and and I kind of <laughs> myself struggled as well a lot of times. And and I guess that is the other question when we think about the high points is with the real high highs there's often real low lows. 
Mm. What is your experience of, of those low lows? Uh, for me, I, I, I've had some really, really low lows and like, I've been quite open about them. And, uh, you know, the last couple of years, I decided to start talking about my mental health because I'd been um, st sort of struggling in secret for a lot of my career. Like I wouldn't tell anyone I had depression or that I'd been, uh, you know, s struggling with addiction and stuff like that. It was super, super shameful. So I didn't talk about it. Um, but yeah, there came, came a point, 2017, I came off the road uh, and kind of cancelled everything because I wanted to make an album. Uh, and it was the first time I'd stopped touring. Like I was, I would normally do like, you know, at least a hundred shows a year and I, and I didn't do any because uh, I wanted to make an album. And then that was a bit of a trigger and without kind of that distraction of, of seeing audiences and receiving validation and, and the, kind of the constant chaos of being on the road is a big distraction. Without that, I kind of was left on my own and yeah, I really struggled and got into a really bad place and it took me quite a while to recover. I didn't end, end up heading back out on the road for almost two years, so I couldn't really work, couldn't really do what I do. Uh, and that was really hard. But then I'd, when I did come back out, I decided that I was going to make it my mission to talk about it and not, you know, and hopefully help other people not suffer with that. Because the main thing that brought me right down was that feeling ashamed of it and feeling like I couldn't talk about it. And that if I did, my world would be over. Um, yeah. And then since then, I've ended up doing a lot of stuff around mental health. Like I do a lot of, you know, I speak at a lot of industry events on panels and I I, I made a whole album kind of promoting mental health awareness. I did a TED talk about it and I made a whole show about it, which I took to Edinburgh and that got shortlisted for the mental health award. And it's like, okay, I feel like I've done that now. Like now it's more just like, I, I, I'm happy to talk about it and I, I'm gonna encourage people to talk about it, but it's stopped being the kind of central focus of what I'm doing. Uh, it's just become part of who I am. And that's, yeah, I'm really proud of that whole journey. And, and of course, the project you're working on at the moment really mm. respond to that as well because you're you're bringing people together and and the show the more recent shows of yours i've seen really demonstrates how you try and build or help people build their own confidence and therefore having a positive impact on the, on their mental health it it feels like that's a real driver for some of those family shows do you think that's the case yeah, so I kind of have two main offerings now uh, since I kind of came back out from uh, from depression. Like, I've got my offerings for families, and I've got my offerings which which aren't suitable for kids, they're for grown ups, which are a bit ruder. But then it's the same idea behind both of them, which is like, yeah, find out who you truly are, and don't be afraid to stand up and be that person. Like, and the, and the main reason that my shows are based around that is for for my own benefit. Like, I learned this. You've got to you've got to nurture yourself. And I think a lot of the problems I had as a younger adult were, I really wanted some, someone else to come and rescue me, rescue me. I wanted the world to, to nurture me. And I felt like put out and I'd felt entitled and I, and I, you know, it's a long story and I got diagnosed with PTSD and this is a, a real uh, common problem with people who are struggling with PTSD is that you feel like victimized and you don't feel safe. But the way you grow and the way you learn is to self-care and, and to, to be your own hero. And so part of, part of my practice, which I, I've learned this, like every inch of energy you put into your work or into your show or into anything really, you have to counterbalance that with the same amount of energy on self-reflection and self-care. So for me, it, other people it's different, but for me it's yoga and meditation and exercise. And also putting it back into my work so then this message I'm giving to the families or to my, my grown up audiences, which is believe in yourself. Don't be afraid when things are difficult. It's okay to be different. Um, yeah, all of those messages, I'm pumping them out, but really it's just helping me reinforce that in myself and in my own. It's amazing. I learned a lot about how the brain works. Like the more you repeat things, the stronger the neural pathways become and they become second nature. So if you just, those affirmations and things, they really work. If you truly repeat to yourself, no, I am strong, I can cope with this, or, or it's okay that I'm having a really hard time right now, there's a global pandemic going on, like all of that kind of, it starts to become the default, and then it becomes a lot less work to feel like that. And, and you also, you've just highlighted the combination of, of different, different things you do to look after yourself, being your work, but exercise, mm. uh, 
you know, reflective time. Do you think being an artist or taking part in a creative activity is very much part of that range of support? I do now. Like, uh, the honest truth is that in the past, my work hasn't always been healthy. Like, it's, it's always been kind of essential for my well-being. Like, if I stop creating, I, I get really down really quickly. So it's a real, for me, it's a really important part of my well-being is to create. But then there's the other side of it, which is the like you create which i think is a really positive side but then there's the kind of uh the sharing side or the i don't know what you'd call it but i've i've read a lot about this there's so many artists who feel the same way that like the sharing it with the world is it's like wounding yourself it's very painful so i did a whole series of uh live stream podcasts where i was talking with different artists about the, this exact thing like creativity and and well-being and like yeah that side of it i had been really unhealthy for me for a long time like a lot of the reason why i think I was what people might call successful, so like breaking world records or doing world tours or becoming world champion. Like these things were actually driven from a really unhealthy place where I would I would work so hard and I'd sacrifice everything else, including my own well-being, just to get this goal. Um, and that actually becomes an, an addiction in itself. That actually becomes another way to avoid the pain of, of reality. Uh, and then when you do get kind of back home off of those tours or whatever and you've got to do those human things like take the bins out or just just be a human it's really really hard because you're like no I am, I'm a megastar I shouldn't have to do this or whatever I shouldn't have to feel these feelings or and that's really dangerous so yeah I think work is really really healthy and a really important like especially creative work it's a really important part of being healthy but it has to be balanced it has to be an equal part in your kind of your pie of your life you've got your family you've got your work you've got your self-care you've got your i don't know your friendships your love life like all those things have to come together to create this healthy pie chart and if any of them get out of proportion then you'll get off balance or i will anyway and that's very much the same for everybody no one is Im immune uh to to a, a compromise of their own mental health if they don't look after themselves yeah i think a lot of us sometimes feel like we are immune or that we're uh you know we're not actually 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 vulnerable uh and that and that can be quite dangerous like that was me for a long time i would never tell anyone what was happening at least of all myself so yeah i, th I think the more we talk about it and the more that especially for young people like i think if the people who i looked up to when i was young had been able to be vulnerable with me and tell me that they also had these doubts uh, I think I'd have found it a lot easier. So that's why I'm really keen to just make sure the young people who look up to me understand that I'm human too and I'm vulnerable too and that I, I struggle as well. Then that hopefully makes them feel okay about feeling that too. And I guess that, that leads us on really, really nicely um, to your current project. You know, we're, mm. we're not sitting in a room together um, no. for, for very clear and understandable reasons right now. And you've responded to that um, by creating a particular project. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about um, Homeschool Beatbox Adventures? I'd love to. Yeah, Homeschool Beatbox Adventures is, uh, is a show that I've created during lockdown um, to help families learn music in an engaging way uh, and connect with each other, feel more confident in their voices and also to raise money for the NHS. So, um, yeah, it's a weekly show every Thursday, 2 p.m. We've done two episodes so far. The first episode had 25,000 people watching. The second episode was yesterday, had 30,000 people watching. I'm like, this is crazy. That is like headlining a festival, like reaching that many people at once. It's, it just feels crazy. Um, and the guests that I've been having are mad as well. We had Katie Tunstall last week. We had Jason Mraz yesterday. Uh, and then we've got loads of other people like Bill Bailey and Bastille and all Basement Jacks are all going to be joining me over the... We've got four left um and it's been amazing like like i say it's felt like riding another wave like i've just been doing back-to-back -back press interviews like all of the last week i've had four or five interviews every day every day and it's like it just feels weird because those these kind of periods of frenzied activity historically in my career have been based around a tour or like a big tv thing we're doing or whatever like some big physical event but this has all been virtual and all happened from this room and and that's kind of yeah, it's, there's been a lot of innovation that we've had to do, I've had to do, and I've recruited this team of volunteers to help me. And um, it's been so fun, really, 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 really cool. I'm so proud of it. And it, 
and we're already at like seven i think we're going to hit 75 percent of our target i think we're i looked this morning we were one pound off so <laughs> we're gonna, gonna raise loads of money for the nhs and and again what that what that does i've watched it with my family we've we've all been getting involved and it's bringing it brings people together because everyone is having a really different experience mm. this lockdown and for some people they're on their own for some people they're 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 in a house with their family all the time trying to juggle work and homeschool and self-care and all of those things and it, it's it's really it's it is really challenging um, and yeah. I, I don't think any anyone would 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 say otherwise but what i found about the the two episodes that that we've done so far is it just brings us together as a, as a family to do something collectively mm. which, which feels really important to we talk about connecting we're connecting with people right now by mm. by having having this conversation and share it sharing it with our audiences and, and with our listeners but to connect inside your home as well is is really important and to do that collectively what what is the feedback you're getting from the people who have been taking part oh it's been lovely honestly it's been so lovely because we've got this um i call it the zoom room so i wanted to have like an audience that i could see visually because i've done lots of live streaming before but you're normally just staring at a camera and you might get like a load of comments like text comments but this new idea is to create like a digital stage and a digital audience so there's like 50 families a week can be part of this zoom room and then you know what we're doing then gets broadcast out to the thousands of people around the world but um but that's so lovely because you get that visual feedback and you can see um like the grown-ups and the kids like I, I make them work together like i tell them the kids grab the grown-ups don't let them sit down make them and like I'm, I'm watching them physically drag the parents to their feet and the parents like taking a breath smiling and getting involved and i think that's you know what i mean we're we're so deep into this lockdown now and like i've got two little ones and it my engagement with them has also struggled it's got at first it was all like yeah we're going to do this we're going to do this and gradually it's just gets so hard to juggle your work to juggle your family your homeschooling and look after yourself so like it's been really fun watching it watching the parents kind of come to life as well and i've had a lot of messages a lot of like little clips of of families uh playing and exploring and just being silly and just connecting like that's that's key right that's absolutely vital for us to survive this is is not to just get stuck into a monotony and get isolated and a, and a breath of fresh air in you know in in, in a week as, of groundhog day um, yeah. as you say um, and and there's real similarities between this online show and your live family shows as well yeah. Because my experience of your live family shows is 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 very much the same. I think you know sometimes parents come to a show and they bring their kids and they sit them down. And they go, oh great, I can sit down for sit down for an hour and they can get on with that. But it's not that at all. Everyone gets involved. Yeah, I think like so. Yeah, this this online version is an adaptation of the stage show that I've been touring for a little while called Shlomo's Beatbox Adventure for Kids. And that show it says for kids, but the truth is. There's a lot of grown-ups who might be my age or, or, so, or so and who've grown up listening to the kind of music that you would normally listen to in an environment that wasn't suitable for kids. Let's put it that way. So like loud, loud music, rave music or whatever, house or drum and bass or hip hop or whatever. And a lot of those people just like me have grown up and have now had kids and don't get to go out at night and don't get to go out and, and dance like they used to. So this show becomes an excuse for those slightly cooler parents to come and bring their kids out and show them this this world in a safe way um so yeah the kids really enjoy it and they get to express themselves but i think the reason that show was was has been so successful that the, the touring version of it is because it's for the grown-ups they get to have a bit of fun and they get to explore and connect with their kid um yeah so that does seem to be translating to the online version so i'm really happy about that and you're not you, you've you've already mentioned you're not doing this show alone you've got mm. coll collaborators um joining you and are those people you've worked with before on other projects that that are joining you it's a mixture so i had the idea about to about a week and a half before we launched it and i just put out a call on social media saying i've got this idea it's going to help families it's going to help the nhs but i'm going to need some help because uh, obviously I can't have any physical support at all. I have to do, you know, I have to do it all remotely. Um, and 
there are so many answers to that call out like hundreds of emails of people who are like what is this i want to help and i think a lot of people at that stage where a lot of them had no work so creative people just had literally no work to do uh, and were feeling a little bit like they wanted to help the world but couldn't and needed to do something they they this was going to help them do something positive uh so yeah we quite quickly assembled this team there's uh, 12 of us now so there's uh, like filmmakers editors um like producers director graphic designer like it's it's an entire creative team that that are all professionals who, if you wanted to put this on in the normal world, you'd need quite a big budget to pay these guys a lot of money. Uh, but they're all wanting to volunteer because it's helping, you know, none of us are getting paid. We're all just doing this for charity. And uh, and that's brilliant. Like, And, and it all, I keep feeling, I feel a bit, sometimes I feel a bit bad, like they're doing all this work. And I'm a bit like, oh, thank you, thank you so much. And, and if you're not enjoying it, please just say, and, and, and it's okay. And they keep reassuring me being like, I'm doing this for me like I need I need this too so keep going you're you're helping all of us and that's been really really lovely there was a moment just before we launched where I I had to slow things down a bit because it because it was starting to affect my mental health and that the main reason why I hadn't said anything was because I didn't want to feel like I'd let that team down who'd put so many hours in already like the website and this like so many hours had gone into it and I just felt like I was going to let them down but I, in the end I just said guys we're going to have to delay a bit because I just need to go to bed for a day and everyone was of course they were lovely about it like and if they hadn't been lovely about it then they wouldn't have been the right team members do you know what i mean but they were they were like dude take your time we're, we're not in a rush so yeah it humanity always always blows me away like when things are hard they come together and they i think that's why the human race has taken over this planet is because we work together and we look out for each other on the whole and, and that's exactly what's happening at the moment, just in terms of the <clears throat> the speed in which people are adapting or having to adapt, whether that's just your daily routine or whether that's how you make something um, is extraordinary. We've all felt that here at Wiltshire Creative. We, we've had to change direction and mm. the speed is exciting and it does keep you going. But I think I think that's a really useful thing to acknowledge that sometimes you just have to go stop. Mm hmm. Yes, we can achieve this, but is it good for anybody? But that's it. Like for me, Together. it was a real thrill because we like we launched so quick. We put the whole team together so quickly, and like every little, you know, every email that came in with people volunteering was felt really good for me, and it felt like there was this real validation to it. And I, but then the the reason why I did decide to slow down is because I realised that I felt amazing when I was working on the project. So then I was like, well, let's work longer and longer hours and I was having these 3 a.m. finishes to try and get get it all done um, but I realized that every time I stopped I just felt really awful and it wasn't really anything to do with the project it's because do you know what I mean like things are hard at the moment I've lost friends and I've got two other friends who were hoping are gonna make it and it's like genuine grief like real it's not some pain that you can just be like oh don't be so don't be so silly or don't be so pathetic or something it's, it's real and so yeah doing something really fun and validating is is a positive thing to do and a really effective distraction but also if you're if that's getting in the way of you actually feeling the pain and, and going through your grief it's going to come back in a much harder harder way so that's partly for me it's just trying to stay conscious of this because it's so rewarding you know we're going out to like thousands of people and there's like hundreds and hundreds of these comments coming in and lots of praise and that can really feel good like the dopamine release is huge and you're like yeah I'm a star but then it's really important to just make sure you're not letting that um, stop you feeling your hard feelings as well because they are very real and very valid and need some time like you've got to I have to give myself time to just be sad and just be down because it's a hard time as well it is absolutely and given that our immediate futures look slightly different and even unknown than they did before have have you got any plans beyond this project or is mm. the focus and then we reset so this project is is definitely dominating the next few weeks uh, although i've just received another pretty big commission that we're, i can't really say much about it because we're not announced it yet but we will do soon which is another commission all about um, lockdown, uh, which is going to be a grown-up offering. So I'll be able to announce that really soon. But um, yeah, like for me, 
the initial feeling when you know I had a hundred shows planned, I had almost a hundred shows planned for this summer. And that immediate feeling when they all started falling away, it all happened in the space of about a week. They all just started being cancelled, and then they all just disappeared. And that was really hard and really horrible. And I was thinking, is there ever going to be a future for me as a performer? Like, you know, are they ever going to open theatres again, or are we ever going to have music festivals again? That was really horrible. And at the moment, I'm still having that question like there's still huge uncertainty as to what is going to happen going forwards and if people in my industry are ever going to be able to make a living like the musicians union posted their the survey yesterday i think it was like 92 percent of their members have had a horrific impact on their uh, on their income so like uh yeah it is scary but for me like new things are evolving like new, like so this project i've been doing for families doesn't provide me an income but it provides me an outlet and a and a, a platform my, for my creative expression and a way to connect to my audience. Um, but, you know, this commission that's coming in, that's a little bit of money, so I'm actually going to be able to pay my bills for a little while, and then hopefully by the time that's delivered, something else. Do you know what I mean? Things tend to evolve. Like like I say about humans, they're very adaptable. So, yeah, I, I go from being super anxious about the future to kind of being quite intrigued and excited about what's going to happen and what, what new innovations are going to come about from from all of this change and being ready to to ride that wave as you suggest yeah get your surfboard when, ready when the next one comes surfboard. along yeah yeah, yeah. We, we're all going to get our surfboards ready as arts organizations and venues and artists and 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 we'll, we'll get on that wave at the right at, at, all at the same time yeah. um shlomo thank you so much for My pleasure me today and what is such an incredibly busy time for you and i hope um our audiences really enjoy homeschool beatbox adventures which is really really good fun and it's on live 2 p.m every thursday and then it's on it sits on youtube so you can dip into it at other times as well which is really exciting and we really look forward to the new commission and hearing about that and getting involved with with that too and and thank you for, for for using your time creatively as well to raise awareness and money for the NHS, which of course right now is is fundamentally important. So so thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. <laughs>